What's up, Earth Rockers? Uh, it's your boy Shovatar here, coming at you with another Castlevania 3 gameplay commentary video. And I'm gonna go slightly. I'm gonna slightly break with my earlier traditions of only uh, only reviewing one run per like character route. I'm gonna be commenting on both these Grant runs because they each have something about them that's remarkable. In the case of the normal run, it was some of the things that happened in the run itself. In the case of the hard mode run, it's I really want to talk about the clock tower on hard mode. But before we get there, I have to explain something real quick. Just get this out of the way. Um, this is a 1cc. You'll notice at the top of the screen it says that I have 10 lives. Uh, the reason for that is because the only codes that let you start off on second quest with a companion is the help me code. Or are the help me codes, rather. And the help me codes start you off with a companion of your choice and also 10 lives. But the stipulation that I've given myself for this run in order to replicate the three lives that you would normally get at the start of a Castlevania 3 run is that if the life if that, that life counter ever gets down to 7, then the run is basically over. Not basically over, the run is over. If it gets down to 7, then I die. But of course, I'm perfectly free to get as many extra lives as I want until then. Uh, having Grant from the start doesn't really make a difference on level 1. The only thing that changes is really the spot here. I can jump up, jump up on this platform up here to get 7,000 points. Normally I wouldn't go out of my way just to get points, but I'm doing it here because every 20, 000, the first 20,000 point, points you get gives you an extra life, and then every 50,000 points after that gives you another extra life. And for a game like this, I want to get all the extra lives I can as quickly as I can. I don't want to be I don't want to be uh, off by some margin later in the run because I because I chose not to get that. Uh, but like I said, having Grant for level one doesn't make too much of a difference. I'm doing this room pretty badly. This is not a great skull gauntlet. Uh, yeah, especially there. Um, but having Grant for the clock tower when I get there that is going to be significant. Uh, but right now it's pretty much nothing. I think, um, actually, this is funny. Uh, level one is difficult because, okay, so what's happening there, what's happened there is that that candle there that I stopped in front of has an axe in it. And I want to get to the level one boss with the holy water, not the axe, but it's like really hard to whip at things near that candle without accidentally picking up the axe, which is why I was just standing still and waiting and like trying not to do anything. I was waiting for the zombie to keep going so that I could jump across the gap safely. What I should have done there actually is switch to Grant, just pick up the axe, and then just kept going. But unfortunately, I didn't. And that's the first death of the run in fucking level one. And that should be an illustration of something that I've said before in other videos, which is that on hard mode, um, level one of Castlevania 3 actually is a problem. Specifically that spot right there where it's the zombies and the bats coming at you. Uh, and I could have reset. I probably should have reset if I was being smart, but this was, um, this is, I think I'd spent a lot, a long time doing attempts, and this was like, what, this was, the, this was one attempt in a long line of attempts, and I didn't want to, I didn't, I just didn't feel like restarting again. I didn't feel like doing the first part of level one again, I just said fuck it and decided to keep going. Uh, which I would not recommend, generally speaking. If you're ever going to try to 1cc and you die in the first, like, two minutes of gameplay, I don't think it's really worth it to keep going. I think it's smarter probably to reset. That's what I should have done, but I didn't. And what's what's kind of stupid about that death is that it was because I was trying not to get the axe, but this boss is not difficult enough to warrant that like I need the holy water for it. Like this is perfectly fine. I got through one four without holy water, didn't need it. Like I got through one three without holy water, didn't need it, now I'm killing the boss not well, like that was a bad boss fight, but that was just because I, I played poorly. You don't need the holy water to make sure that boss goes smoothly. I think I wanted the holy water anyway, just in case something went wrong in 1-4, and I took some damage, and I... Because that boss is easy, but it's hard to kill him without taking at least one hit from him. So, I think that's why I wanted holy water, but it was not the an advantage that was worth risking death for. And now here we come to what I wanted to commentate this video for, which is the clock tower on a hard mode. Now, I mentioned earlier that I needed to enter a specific code to start the second quest with a companion. That's because in second quest you can't acquire companions. You can't pick any of them up. Because I think the the intent is that you go to second quest straight from a normal run, so you'd already have a companion if you wanted one. Um, but the fact that you can't get companions in second quest, and the fact that there is no benefit to doing the clock tower level except to get Grant, means that there is literally never any reason to set foot in the clock tower on hard mode. There's no reason for anybody to be here, which is why I think it's comically difficult. 
Um, the clock tower on normal is full of Medusa heads. So, of course, in keeping with that pattern, keeping with the Castlevania 3 hard mode pattern, that means that the clock tower on hard mode is going to be full of the skulls. The skulls that you saw back there in level one that, that fucked me up so badly, that did like three that hit me like three times. Those skulls are a huge problem because their patterns are random. They'll they'll bob up and down, but then sometimes they'll like stop short in the middle of like their their vertical movements and go horizontally. Um, so it makes it really really difficult to hit them because you because you don't know what they're going to do. You can't position yourself ahead of time. You have to just get lucky basically and react. Uh, appropriately and react really swiftly, which is why my strategy for getting through the clock tower is to just stopwatch spam through all the spots where the skulls are, which is why you see Grant with the stopwatch. It's why I'm farming all these hearts. I'm going to stopwatch spam on Grant instead of Trevor because Grant is faster than Trevor. I actually stopwatch there too, just to get around those bats, just, I guess, to be safe. I probably didn't really need to do that. I could have saved those hearts purely for the skull section, but I did it anyway. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, Grant is faster than Trevor, which means that he'll be able to get through these rooms by spending fewer hearts, and he might be able to dodge enemies that Trevor wouldn't be able to get out of the way of. Because ascending the clock tower on hard mode, when it's full of like like random-ass skulls flying at you, is really difficult. But the rooms where they appear do sort of give you a tool to avoid them, which you're going to see in a moment here when I go up these steps and get into the next room. So every room with a skull is not an auto scroller, but it's it's a it's a it's a stage that moves upwards where you can climb up you're climbing up the stairs. And that's actually really good as far as the skulls are concerned, because one of the few ways to like safely get out of the ways of the way of the skulls is to get a lot of vertical distance on them. Because regardless of their random horizontal movements, the peak and the highest and lowest point of their regular movements don't change. They can't randomly shoot up higher than, than normal. Uh, sometimes sometimes it seems like they can because they'll stop short during a vertical movement, but it's not like the, the apex of their vertical movements are literally random in terms of how high they go. Basically what I'm saying is that if you go far enough above a skull, then it can't possibly hit you. And that's sort of what you have to do for all these early areas of the clock tower with all the skulls is just try to get above them as quickly as possible. It really is just a race to outrun them. And so using Grant for that purpose, combined with the stopwatch, just to using it as often as possible, just to make absolutely sure they don't get to me, is how you get through this area. And it's why having Grant for the clock tower on hard mode, not just the descent, but the ascent, is super, super good. See, I'm just scampering up all these blocks. It's perfect. That was beautiful. I didn't take any damage there. And that was the result of, of preparation of getting all those hearts for the stopwatch and because I actually made use of Grant's abilities. And that's one of the things I do like about this level, actually, even though it's completely optional and it's full of RNG skulls, is that it does force you to really utilize Grant to his full potential. So in a way, it sort of makes sense that you don't have to come, or that you, you don't have to come here to get Grant on second quest because uh Grant is like the best tool for getting through that that area. And getting him only halfway through would mean only taking advantage of him for half the level. And here we are defeating Grant, even though Grant is already in my party, so this is sort of like a time paradox. Or not it's just a just a paradox in general, I guess. And is presumably part of the reason why the developers didn't want you um uh you know what? Axe acts that point. There was no point being made there. So the second half of level two is the same on normal as it is on hard in that it mostly comes down to how effectively you can utilize Grant to get through the rooms quickly, to fall down in specific spots. I don't I don't completely let <laughs> that's so funny. I'm having trouble hitting that guy. Grant uh, has a very short range attack. Um, I don't the only thing I don't like about the descent through the clock tower is that it heavily favors prior knowledge of the level layout, because what you're supposed to do is fall down quickly to get away from the enemies and just to get out faster. But there are gaps in the floor, there's like spikes, so unless you know the room ahead of time, unless you remember what the room looked like on your way up, jumping down like that on Grant, which is the most efficient way to get out of the stage, is also really risky. So. It's not a problem for me because of my level of familiarity with the game at the at the point that I was doing this run, but that is something about it that's always kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and it makes it feel a little bit like a leap of faith, because Grant does have air control, but he falls so fast that if you jump off at a point where there are spikes underneath you, it's not really necessarily feasible to react quickly enough to dodge out of the way, dodge out of the way of the spikes before you get hit by them. 
Um, here I try to do something fancy to climb over that skull, and I probably should have just crouched and stabbed it to kill it and get through, but it's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, what's interesting is that the clock tower is a spot in the run that I was expecting to die in, and it's because it because the thing that I'm the worst at in every Castlevania game that I've played so far is the platforming. And the clock tower is fucking full of platforming. Like, you have Grant to help you out with it, but still, it doesn't mean that Grant is immune to having things like that happen. Like getting hit by bats randomly off the side of the screen, which can then mean you get knocked into death pits. So, usually platforming heavy areas are like my... my worst areas in in castlevania games but surprisingly enough i actually get out of this level without dying a single time which is more than i could have that i ever could have hoped for honestly because whenever the rng skulls are involved th like those are the most difficult sections of the entire game it's pretty much this and then um a1 at the very at the very end the second room of a1 rather and yeah i fr froze time there because once you hit the floor at the end of the clock tower, everything despawns, and you just leave the level. You don't have to actually walk to the door yourself. Um, but that was a pretty clean descent. Like I said, I didn't die at all. That's probably one of the best clock towers I've ever done, honestly. Um, you know, it's not that difficult if you plan properly. That's what a lot of this run kind of is like. A lot of these Castlevania 3 runs, they're, they're just mostly about planning and routing and having the correct sub-weapons at the right time. That's a really dramatic example of that. We're trying to do that part without the stopwatch is, is really, really tricky. You're really at the mercy of the skulls. And I do a cool little jump over that owl, and I would love to say that that was intentional, but it absolutely was not. This whole owl section is actually very sloppy and strange. And I don't really remember why it's like this. I think the reason why it's like this, why I'm like, why I'm fucking with these owls and not just like killing them efficiently, is because I was doing this run off of a whole bunch of Sypha only runs, and I think I'd just gotten more accustomed to the timing involved with killing them with Sypha's cane or with lightning. But that's that's. Uh, but I, I, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Because that's not related to, to this run. That's just why I think it's like that. That's my that's my theory. I'm having trouble producing words today. Anyway, um, Grant, like in level one, is not super important in level three, and he doesn't become game changing until level four. That's sort of uh, the same as as how it is on normal mode. But what's interesting about hard mode is that Taking more damage turns areas that are trivial on normal into legitimate hazards on hard, which we're going to be coming up to shortly. Um, a quick note here on this route this route split you're about to see. You actually can take Grout with you on the Alucard route, which is what that, that lower pathway is. But there's no reason to ever do that, and I would never recommend doing that. Um, because a lot of the Alucard stages, especially Alucard 7, are, def are, are, are definitely designed around Alucard. Um, anyway, yeah, this is one of the areas I was talking about, where the spot with these these like jellyfish are completely... That is so bizarre. I, I don't actually know what happened there. I guess I would I would maybe need to slow that down frame by frame. Because usually when they die, they spew out those little mini radishes or whatever they are. But when I jumped on them like that, it was like a fucking Castlevania 1 like crit. Where in Castlevania 1, if you hit an enemy on the same frame that they hit you, you do like a million damage. And there it was like I killed him and all of the, the radishes he was hiding inside of himself like at the same time. And then he dropped the axe. So that was just fucking weird. Um, I don't want the axe. I only want the cross for this part of the game just for the, for the Cyclops fight. And I think Grant still has the stopwatch. And I think I'm... I think he's going to hold on to the stopwatch for the rest of the run. I don't exactly remember. Because it's been a while since I since I did this. But um, this is the closest you're going to get to a completely plain, um, uh, like, like mostly Trevor run of the game without it literally being only Trevor. Because Grant is not like Sypha where he's out all the time. He's not like... Uh, Alucard, where he's out in really, in really particular, um, or he really shines in specific scenarios. He's sort of, a, he's sort of a convenience guy. He's there more for fun. 
So the Cyclops fight here, is this a good fight or is this a bad fight? This is a pretty good fight, actually. Or no, it's not, because the lower the lower crosses weren't hitting him. Yeah, this fight is, is easy, but it's hard to do quickly, because you have to time your cross throws very specifically so that it hits him not too high and not too low. If you throw at the apex of your jump, it'll be too high up, and then if you wait too long to throw and you're falling back down, it'll hit this chest, which isn't going to do any damage to him. So that fight's a pain in the ass. And Grant, unfortunately, is not at all helpful with that. The JP In the JP version of the game, Grant has throwing daggers as his default weapon. Um, so he's a lot better in JP. That's one of, that's one of, of several reasons why the ja Japanese version is better. Or is not, well, better uh, subjectively, but easier objectively than the US version. And, okay, no, no, I am going to drop the stopwatch here. Right, I want the axes on Grant, and I want the stopwatch on Trevor. So they're kind of going to do like a little sub-weapon swap in a minute here. And that's because there's something that I want Grant to do with axes later on in the run. Um, if you've already watched my, my Deathless normal commentary, I'm going to be repeating a lot of the same points that I made in that one, because this run is fundamentally the same. The same things, more or less, are going to be happening. But I just wanted to talk about the clock tower, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about anything that I might have missed in in talking about this run and this route in the Deathless in the Deathless video. I could climb up there to hit that lantern if I wanted to. There's a there's five hearts in there, but it's just it's just pointless to do because the more time you spend in that room, the more time you have to deal with those skulls, and the more shots you let them get at you. Uh, the higher chances the one of the shots uh, is successful. Basically what I'm saying is that the more times you let a skull dive at you, the higher the odds are that he's actually going to hit you. This is a pretty cool move here. That's actually pretty risky, um, getting the falling swing on that red skeleton there. That was kind of um, that was kind of risky. I stopped there for a second to try to get a batch of spawn, but I couldn't stop for very long because there was a, um, there was a dude chasing after me. Normally what I would do there is kill that ghost with an axe first, then step on the lower platforms to bait a bat to spawn and then jump across but i didn't do that i am just getting my shit pushed in by these bats this is fucking ridiculous um but that's just kind of what happens in castlevania 3 these bats are super dangerous and this is um like i said level four is where grant becomes useful this is uh, a very very important thing that he does in this part of 4b and especially in the next room as you'll see in a moment um this is really really tough to get figured out um a normal and here I am just getting hit by everything and and just unloading every every ounce of spaghetti I have in my pockets trying to kill this guy. And the reason why that was so awkward was because I was trying to jump and then hit up and B to throw the axe at the same time. But jumping up on a ceiling like that with Grant and then hitting up makes him stick to the ceiling and then hitting B makes him drop an axe directly downwards so i was trying to jump and throw the axe but the game interpreted my inputs as jumping sticking to the ceiling and then throwing the axe down which is why it took me so long to kill that guy and my my kill on the ghost also was not very good um although i'm not sure there was necessarily anything i could have done about that and that is the one thing about grant that i don't really like is that it's very e it's easier for him to not do what you want him to do than it is for a lot of other than it is for for the game in general. But somehow I make it through 4C without taking any damage, and I'm not worried about this Gorgon mini-boss here, even though usually this thing is like almost always going to do damage to me, because I know that I can do this. This is another reason why Grant is good in level 4, is because he has a guaranteed no-damage kill on the mini-boss. You just sit on the ceiling, throw the axes down. And that's why that property that he has of sticking to ceilings and throwing axes is actually useful, and why I can't be too mad at the game for assuming that I wanted to do that. But um, but that's what went wrong earlier in 4B. And here I stopped for a second because I'm trying to decide whether or not to go for the meat over to the right or just skip the level entirely. And I decide to go for the meat because I'm thinking about the mummy boss fight at the very end. I, I think I can probably get through most of the last stage of level 4 without taking damage, but the mummy fight is a real crapshoot without Sypha. Without Sypha and without lightning or fire, that thing can always just 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 hit you. If you're not careful, so I decide to ultimately go for the meat and brave the bird gauntlet. Uh, it was a risk. It would have been a risk either way. I was basically choosing between one risk or another. Well, I was choosing between one of two risks, and I picked. Um, I don't really know if I'm still not really sure if I made the right choice there. I think I just figured I might as well go for it because because 
I wanted to at least have a chance of surviving the whole the whole stage. I was basically going for the biggest um, the biggest possible reward there, and uh, and it paid off. I got to the meat without taking damage, and I'm going to get to the mummy fight without taking damage. I think so. And I think I get out of this level without dying. It's so funny how my only death so far has been on level one, and it was to like a such a weird. Um, Almost like a phobia on my part of getting the axe in level one instead of the holy water. It just goes to show that sometimes you are your own worst enemy, and sometimes you can overcommit to certain ideas, or you can like get something into your head that you need something that you don't actually need, and it can really, really fuck you over. Uh, but there's nothing like that here in level four. I think I think my handling of level four is pretty good. The only problem really was was four B when I was just getting slammed over and over again by the bones, and that was like an input problem which is not a super common problem in castlevania 3 but is a problem that i sort of blame myself the least for because i know i didn't make any wrong decisions i just made sort of a mechanical error and that might not have i don't know if that looked risky or not to you guys if you were paying attention you would have noticed that there were some bandages that the last mummy shot that went right over my head and that almost hit me so I think I might get through this whole fight without taking damage, which would mean that, technically speaking, I didn't need to go for the meat back in 4D, but it's all about minimizing risk. It's all about trying to make the safer decision. And throwing an axe at a couple of birds, I decided, was less risky than trying to get through the mummy fight without taking any damage. Um, I take damage on the cyclops. Okay, so I did make the right decision going for the meat, because I took damage on the cyclops. So... That's interesting that it was the Cyclops that damaged me and not the Mummy, because the Cyclops is, generally speaking, more controllable than the Mummy is, although his behavior is still sort of, I don't want to say random, because I think, I'm sure he's reacting to, to what I'm doing, but sometimes he will do things that catch me off guard. Like, the reason that I took damage there is because he turned around and I didn't expect him to turn around, and I jumped into him. And I don't exactly know what causes that. And now I'm playing super cautiously, which is why this is now taking forever. Um, what you want to do optimally for the Cyclops fight is when you're running between these two platforms, you keep jumping. Because jumping in between these two platforms sometimes prevents him from charging. I think he'll charge at you if he thinks you're too far away from him. So jumping will slow you down to the point that he thinks he doesn't have to charge to catch up to you, but it also means that if he does actually charge, then you might be going too slowly across that middle area to get to the next platform to jump over him when he gets to you. So it's pretty risky. And it's safer to just run back and forth without jumping until the AI randomly decides not to charge. But that can lead to that game of tag back there where I'm just like running back and forth for 20 seconds and, and, and nothing is happening. So it's boring, but it's also safe. And I ultimately get through the fight with health to spare. I was two hits away from death at the end there. And uh, and that's that's what you like to see. I said in my deathless commentary that Grant is not useful in level 5, and uh, I'm not going to make the same mistake again and say that here. I will say that his his contributions are less dramatic than they are in level 4, because he's not going to be skipping any major areas. Because that 4B, what happened on 4B, I guess you wouldn't know this if you're not super familiar with the game and with the level layout. There's like a whole other area of 4B that I didn't do, because Grant... Um, skipped it for me there was like another there's like two more bone throwers and another ghost and it's like another it's just another shit show that grant helps you avoid and there's nothing like that in level no, nothing as impactful as that happens in level five most of grant's contribution to level five is going to come in 5b helping you do the vertical auto scroller more easily and then the simple fact that he has axes is 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 useful in and of itself um, and the reason why Trevor can't have axes is because I really want the stopwatch on Trevor for 5C. And in my Cypher review, I talked about using lightning to get through 5C and said that what's nice is that there's lightning right before 5C. So if I was playing Cypher and I died before, like at some point in 5B, like or before the very end of 5B, then I could still pick up lightning getting into 5C. That's not the case here with the stopwatch. There's no like like backup stopwatch that, available that I am aware of. If I die before 5C, I'm going to lose the stopwatch. There might be a stopwatch somewhere in 5B that I don't know about, but but I don't know about it. I don't think so. Basically, what I'm getting at with all that confusing word salad and reference to other runs is that I cannot die in level five. Or Rather, I really don't want to die, because it's the stopwatch is not technically mandatory to get through 5C, but it makes it a hell of a lot easier. 
um, and you'll see why when I get there. And I'll try to explain in more depth than I have in the past what like the non-stopwatch, non-lightning, non-cheese strategy for 5C looks like. Because 5C is a series of staircases and turrets. And the way that you go through it without any kind of like cheese ability, without any kind of like special help, is... Um, I wonder if that's getting picked up. Sorry, there's like... There's ambulance sirens outside. Somebody... Somebody's having a worse time than I am. Uh, I don't know if that's going to get picked up. Anyway, what's interesting actually here is that Grant going up this auto scroller as quickly as he has like fucks with the spawns. Like those two knights down there that you see, there aren't supposed to be two knights there. There's supposed to be one knight there. And sometimes also another knight, knight will spawn like underneath you at random points. And I really don't know what causes it, but it, but it only ever seems to happen when I use do this stage with Grant. So it has something to do with the pace at which I'm climbing up the um, the stage. And there, I didn't need to kill that knight because you'll notice that I was playing as Grant and I was right next to that platform where the staircase leading up out of the stage begins. And I could have just jumped up onto that platform as Grant and then just left the, the arena. There's no reason for me to kill that guy. Um, I even could have gotten both these torches with Grant without ever engaging with any of the armors. And I mean, that's not a big deal. I mean, I'm at, I'm, I'm at full health, and the armors are not difficult to kill, so it's not like I took any major risks. But that's just... That's what's interesting about Grant, is that you're constantly... He changes the way that you think about the game, and he changes the way that you look at the layout of the levels. And you're constantly... Once you're, like, tuned in to, like, the Grant waves, you're on the Grant frequency, you start to see levels differently. You start to see things you can skip and see things you can utilize to your advantage. Like, here, if I wanted to, I could have Grant jump across that barrier there to get to the Axeman. But the reason that I'm not doing it is because I have a much safer angle of attack from down here to just hit him with axes until he dies. I don't have to approach him head on. I don't have to risk jumping over that gap and then switching to Trevor and then trying to intercept his axe, etc., etc., etc. So um, that's what I mean when I say the simple fact that Grant has axes is what makes level 5 easier. So here's 5C. Normally what you would do here without the stopwatch is you would take the time to kill both those tur turrets at the bottom there. Then you'd stop here and like go intercept the lower fireballs and then go and the higher fireballs go past you. This is what I'm doing here is exactly how you would play this without the stopwatch. Just crouching underneath and hitting him. You would intercept those fireballs there to kill and then kill that turret because he's within the range of your whip. And then here you'd try you would have to sort of position yourself between the turret's line of fire, wait for them to finish firing, and then go past after the fireballs go past you. So that's why the stopwatch is really important there. And I don't know if you noticed that. That was like a couple a couple frames, so you might have to go back in the video. But when I went back down those stairs on Grant, there was a turret at the very top of the screen that did not exist when I was first in that room. Um, and that's... Grant introduces a bizarre, like, X factor into the way that this game functions. And I don't... I don't know why, but this game seems to like glitch a lot when it comes to Grant, and when Grant is around, the game just does unusual things. Um, and unfortunately, the most amazing example of that that I have witnessed is not going to be in this video. It's going to be in a future video about Grant. Um, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested in seeing the way Grant fucks with the game. I understand that speedruns of this game use Grant and then use like some glitch involving stairs to like skip a million levels. I don't know what the fuck that's all about. I don't really know anything about like speedruns of this game. I just know about the game itself because I've played it so much. And here, there actually is a way to do this fight um, consistently with zero damage with Grant. It's kind of like a like a um, a repeat of the Gorgon mini boss. If Grant climbs on the ceiling with axes, drops them on the Frankenstein monster's head, and then crawls away to the far right corner, the blocks that fall from the ceiling never seem to spawn over there. So if I somehow got to that fight with one health and I somehow like didn't get the meat, because there's a meat in a block in the blocks um, near the Frankenstein monster, I didn't need to get it because I was at full health. But if somehow I ever got to that fight and I needed to take zero damage, that would be another option available to me. And that's what I mean when I talk about Grant changing the way that you look at the game. Whether it's necessary or not. And I'm pretty sure... Okay, I thought about collecting a dagger from that torch there because I wanted Grant... There's a bird at the very beginning of the stage that you can just hit with the dagger at the very start to kill, but I ultimately decided that the axe would be more useful for killing future birds because there's two birds between you and the end of 6b and i decided i'll just have the axe to get both birds instead of the daggers ultimately i think i made a mistake i'm not sure if the axe is necessarily the easier way to kill the birds because as you can see sometimes they just do that the axe is fine if the bird is far above you and you're confident that the bird is not going to move but in situations like this um that's not the case 
And the reason that I'm going through 6B on Grant is because I really don't want to lose the stopwatch. I want to use the stopwatch that Trevor has to get through 6C, because 6C is a giant pain in the ass, so I try to go through on Grant, and it's just not a smart decision. Because the fact that Grant's regular attack has such a short range means that the timing that's necessary to kill the fish before they get to you is a lot more stringent. And I just fucked up too many times, and the, and the current knocked me into too many fish, and it was just... It didn't work out, and that was just bad decision making on my part. So I'm not going to have the stopwatch for 6C like I wanted. But I do have essentially a backup plan, which is to do that stage the way that I used to do it, which is with Holy Water. Doing 6C without any sub-weapons at all, like without Lightning, without Holy Water, without the stopwatch, is is possible, but it's, I would say, almost harder than doing 5C without any sub-weapons. Because 5C, you have sort of the luxury of being able to take your time and you can you can sort of stay in one place and keep whipping turret projectiles to like get your bearings but 6c is fucking relentless 6c is like turrets and axe guys and most importantly bats constantly spawning the game just constantly throws bats at you in the second room of 6c and that's the that's really the big problem in fact even just this part here with this axe knight below you it's really tough to get to this guy without any sub weapons because he'll start backing up as soon as you get in front of him. And it's difficult to maintain the proper distance on Trevor where you're both close enough to hit him and far away enough that if he throws an axe, your whip will actually hit it. Because it's possible for him to like throw the axe in between your whip shots and for it to like, it, it's so weird. It kind of looks like the axe passes right through your whip and hits you. But it's really because the whip is like being spawned ahead of your axe, of your, the axe is being spawned like ahead of your whips. Um, hitbox. So it's really difficult to maintain proper spacing fighting that guy, and it's just, it's one reason, it's a minor reason why Holy Water is really important for 6C. The main reason Holy Water is important for 6C is for this part. Um, Holy Water does a couple of things. For one, it gives you a relatively consistent way of dealing with the bats, because the bats come at you in odd angles. And the big problem is this platform here, because what I just did there, ducking to kill that bat, is extremely difficult to do on that platform, because go hitting the down arrow makes you go downstairs. And if you're close enough to stairs, the game will always prioritize sending you down the stairs instead of ducking. So if a bat comes at you at a certain height where you can only hit it by ducking, instead of ducking and hitting it, you're just going to fucking go down the stairs. But the fact that the holy water is thrown at this downward trajectory means that it's perfect for overcoming that particular problem. So that's why I want the holy water for that area. You can kill the turret super easily, you can kill the axe knight super easily, you can kill the bat super easily. And I still get out of it taking one point of damage, but that's actually really good. Getting out of 60 only taking one point of damage is like, I can't really complain because there's going to be meat at the end of the room here that's going to get me back up to full, and I want to be full health for 6D. I picked up the stopwatch on Grant back there to get through this section here in 6D, which you're going to see in just a moment, getting to the level 6 boss. And the level 6 boss is the first um, legitimately difficult boss fight in the Cypher route, because it's it's not 100% predictable. It's not like the Cyclops, where you can like adjust to it, you can like influence its its movements. And it's not like the... It's not like the, uh, the, the, the skeleton monster or the Grant fight in the Clock Tower, where it's just like pure aggression it's 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 a really tricky fight and i'll talk about when i get to it so the reason that i i gave the stopwatch to grant there specifically is even though um you're going to see in a second here trevor's going to pick up the axe so when i just have trevor pick up the stopwatch and the axe is because number one i want the stopwatch on grant for later and number two i want the grant on i want the stopwatch on grant right that second to get through 6d because at the very beginning back there when i use the stopwatch to kill those two birds if trevor tries that um, then the fact that it takes him so long to whip the birds means that he will run out of time and the collapsing floor will catch up with him um, before he can finish killing the birds. And this was actually a really fortunate level six bo level six boss because I killed that 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 serpent so fast. When there's only one serpent, once you're like down to one serpent, the fight is basically over because it's so much easier to react to where he appears and and run into safe zones than it is when there's two of them. Um, which you probably noticed. Like, the first thing that happened when I jumped on that central platform, which is supposed to be the safest spot in the whole arena, is I just got fucking destroyed. And I was lucky enough to hit the same serpent with my first two, like, bursts of damage and kill it really fast. So that was a really good level 6 boss. Um, but you'll notice that I still took 2 damage there. So that's why it's important to get through 6D consistently without taking damage, and to make sure that you can get out of 6C with full health, if with as much health as possible. Because it's really hard to kill that boss without taking damage.
it's not like the Cyclops where it's just about like patience and it's about reaction. It's just about, I mean, well, it is about reaction, but it's not about patience and you, you, you don't always know exactly what it's going to do. There might be a few set patterns that it adheres to, but like I've practiced that boss a million times and I can't figure it out. I can't figure out any level of consistency to its, um, to how it behaves. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe someone knows, but I don't. Uh, level seven is not a problem. Level six is a problem because of six C into the level into six D into the level six boss. All places where things can go wrong. Six D can go wrong um, without the stopwatch because the fishmen that jump up underneath you are on a way more aggressive cycle and they can knock you off the platforms. Which means that if you die on level six boss and you get back to the beginning of six D without the stopwatch, because dying removes your sub weapons. Oh, excuse me, you're in really dire straits, which is why the boss itself is dangerous and dying to the boss is like especially dangerous because it compromises your ability to get through the stage before the stage before the boss again. Um, so yeah, like I began, like starting to say earlier, level seven is not nearly as big of a problem as level six is. And let's see if, okay, sometimes when I kill that, um, that Igor under the harpy, Sometimes like another Igor will appear. If you watch my my Cypher only um one CC and then if you watch the Grant Deathless run, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a very strange thing that I don't that I don't understand, but it has something to do with with the harpy being frozen either with the stopwatch or with freeze and then like the Igor underneath it getting killed. And it like generates a new Igor. I I can't really describe it. There's an interesting thing you could do here with Grant, actually. You can climb across the upper, the ceiling above, to, to completely skip all these turrets. Um, except for the last one, which you pretty much have to kill if you want to get up the final staircase without taking damage. Um, but the reason I'm not doing it is because um, I want to be able to kill that last turret, and Grant doesn't have axes, he has the stopwatch for... Um, what does he have the stopwatch for? I know I want the stopwatch for something. I probably want the stopwatch for, um, for level 9, which I'll talk about when we get there. Uh, but that's why I don't do that, even though it would be really cool to show it off, because um, it's another like really cool grant thing. Um, but unfortunately, you're just going to have to trust me that that's possible. Uh, one of the reasons why level 7 is not a problem is because grant is really helpful for the one part of the level that is a problem, which is this jump right here. This jump is... Um, I don't know how close that looked, but Executing that jump is really precise. You have to be really far along the ledge in order to score that jump. But doing the jump with Grant, I think, makes it easier. Um, at the very least, it means that he gets his his faster movement speed gets him to the edge of the platform faster. I don't really know. I never really figured out if Grant has farther horizontal distance or just farther vertical distance in air control. I I would be surprised if the horizontal dis distance of his jump was exactly the same as Trevor's, but. I don't really know. And in any case, the way that I did the jump back there was not really a good way to do that jump. What you should do for the 7B jump is slowly walk to the very edge until like half your character model is hanging off, then press forward and jump at the same time. But I didn't know that back then, so I did this really risky like run, jump, leap of faith shit to clear that gap. And that is a really bad idea, especially when it's coming right after the whole 6C area, because that is not something you want to do again. That's really weird. The fact that the whip destroyed the block there is really weird. I think it like barely clipped it at the very end of the animation. And what is happening? Oh fuck, I know what's happening. Okay, so I think I I think I'm getting up to use the to use the bathroom at this point. Yeah, so I'm just going to be standing still here for a while. Sorry guys. I guess I could have cut this out. But I didn't want to like I didn't want to insert any like big obvious edits into the video because I didn't want anybody to think that I was like splicing save states together. So I just figured I would keep this recorded footage um, of me standing still and using the bathroom with the timer ticking down just to show that there's no there's no funny business going on and that this is indeed a single continuous run. Um, so yes, unfortunately, the the price of this is now I'm going to be standing here for another like. 30 seconds what is wrong with me did i like fall into the bathroom or something or did i fall into the toilet i don't know what i don't know what's going on exactly but i'm, I'm taking my time i'm probably getting some water too actually is what it is um and now i'm back i'm back at the keyboard i'm back and ready to execute the monster rash correctly that's what this boss fight is it's a mon it's a, it's a three-man monster rash four-man monster mash if you count both dumb both mummies not dummies um getting the having the holy water for levels for the level seven boss 
is pretty much like what you want all the time. But a shot multiplier makes it a lot, a lot nicer because it, you can kill these mummies a lot more quickly with a shot multiplier. Like if you have a shot multiplier and holy water for this boss fight, you can shred these motherfuckers the second they step out of their coffin. You can like toss that shit like right at their feet and have like three holy waters just annihilating both of them at the same time and it's so sick but without the shot multiplier you just have to do these like these wimpy like shot like shots one at the time to like slowly whittle them down and it's really emasculating and humiliating and it's disgusting and i hate it but that's where i'm at and if i really wanted to i could have um gone up and down the stairs to the to the um the down auto scroller that i was at before this to keep respawning the torches before this boss fight and then keep destroying the torches of the holy water to get the shot multiplier but i already wasted a minute pissing and i didn't want to waste any more time before getting on with the run not that i'm concerned about the time limit of the level but i just didn't want to i just didn't want to gum up the works anymore because killing the mummies with the shot multiplier is a lot cooler but it's definitely not mandatory it's just faster it's not um it's not any safer uh, this guy is also easier with a shot multiplier, but it's it's not as dramatic because you, he's not just gonna like sit still on your holy water the entire time. He's gonna move around a little bit, and I still don't exactly understand um, how much damage holy water does to this guy. But it seems to be less than the mummies because well, that, well that's because the holy water is hitting both mummies at the same time. That's why it's such a big advantage. Um, so there's level seven. Level seven is a really appealing color palette. I like the greens and the purples. I like how all the levels in this game kind of like look look different. Um, maybe that's maybe that's something that, that I should just take for granted. But uh, but hey, it takes thought. You know, it's like oh, we should try to make like all these environments distinct. Like we're making an actual work of art, which is what I would classify Castlevania three as. Um, this part of level eight is a gigantic pain in the ass because the zombies were given special um, like iron reinforced bathrobes that meant that they could take one more morning star hit before they die. So that gauntlet there with the bats and the and the with the bats and the zombies is sort of reminiscent of level one with the bats and the zombies, except this time the zombies take more damage. So you just kind of have to like get out of there as quickly as you possibly can. And I got through it pretty well. I don't think I've ever gotten through that part without taking at least one damage. Um, the cross would actually make that a lot easier. Like having like multiple shot multiplier cross, you could just probably shred those motherfuckers. But of course, I don't have that because I wanted the the holy water for the um level seven fight but i mean i could have gotten the cross because there actually is a cross available in the down auto scroller right before the big monster mash so if i really wanted to if like that part was a legitimate problem i needed to get i needed desperately to get through it without taking damage i could use the cross on the level seven boss and i would be pretty much fine because the only time I really need the Holy Water, like 100% mandatory, is for the Grim Reaper fight that's coming up at the end of this level, but there's Holy Water right before the Grim Reaper fight that I can get super easily. So I have some flexibility available to me. I have some like some options available to me. I'm just not necessarily... I just don't really feel the need to take advantage of them. And here, I I should have known that was going to happen. I, I saw him in position to throw that shit at me, and I knew like what route I was jumping up. I could have frozen time with the stopwatch on, on Grant and then just killed the skull and climbed and killed the killed the bone thrower and climbed up the stairs. That's probably what I should have done. Um, because I have plenty of hearts. Like there's so many hearts between here and the Grim Reaper fight. You will never run out of hearts in level eight. Ever, ever, ever. So if I absolutely needed to preserve my health, um, for this part coming up, then I I could have played the first room of A2 a little bit more cautiously, but 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 that's all basically irrelevant because I I have the Grim Reaper cheese down like perfectly at this point in my in my in my level of experience with Castlevania three, so I don't I don't um uh, I don't really need to worry about my health because the Grim Reaper is not going to do any damage to me. I'm I'm fairly confident uh in saying that and this isn't going to be like a like a uh, a hubris thing where I'm, I'm not setting up a joke where the grim reaper somehow killed me no no no. If I, if I have a triple shot if i have a triple shot multiplier uh for the grim reaper then he's just gonna die at this point i could have swapped to grant to jump over that armor back there if i really wanted to but that would be completely pointless and a waste of my time and your time because you'd have to sit there watching me transform and then transform back to do the grim reaper fight and i value your time as much as i value my time which is why I'm going to demolish this guy extra fast. Please actually do it. Please actually do it. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got him. Um, 
you know, yeah, I I always feel bad whenever I watch back footage of the of this of the Grim Reaper fight and the way that I cheese it because I know that the fight I know that somebody poured their heart and soul into designing this boss fight and making it difficult, but um, I don't really care. <laughs> I just I just don't want to die. Uh, I don't want to lose any more lives. And mm, speaking of losing lives, I have not died a single time since level one. How do you like how do you like them apples? But that's not super surprising. Die, getting through level six without dying is good. Getting through level four without dying is good. Getting through level nine without dying would be a real miracle. And that's sort of where that's sort of the nature of Castlevania three one CCs is that you're basically playing the earlier levels really well so that you have the the luxury of being able to die in level nine and level eight, because those are the spots in the run where you're most likely to just get fucking flattened by this game's this game's um, the the anchor the the Looney Tunes thousand pound weight that it constantly holds over your head, just waiting to smash you with. Uh, level nine and level A is where you get sliced in half by the game's spiking difficulty curve. Curb, curb curve difficulty curve and basically what i'm trying to say is that level nine that was a cool axe 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 hit right there cool axe throw basically what i'm saying is that level nine is really hard and level a is really hard and the reason that i went to the trouble of jumping up on that ledge back there to grab the axe is so that i can farm hearts here um for the stopwatch that grant has still been holding on to this whole time to get through nine two and if i can get through nine two without dying then I don't care if I die on 9-4. I'm pretty much expecting to die on 9-4. I'm not expecting to die on 9-3. But if I if I get through 9-2 without dying, then then this run is still like alive. But if I die on 9-2 and I lose this I lose my stopwatch in 9-2 and I have to try to go through 9-2 without the stopwatch, that's a big problem. Because 9-2 is like 5-3 but harder and this is excessive. I don't need to get that. I don't need fucking fifty-one hearts to get through level nine. Like I'm not stopwatch spamming non-stop the entire level. So that's actually pretty ridiculous that I farmed that many hearts. Um, but I did it anyway. I may have slightly been influenced by my by my deathless run where I ended level nine with exactly zero hearts, and I thought I had I had over farmed, but it turned to that turned out due to a, a a bizarre twist of fate that I ended up having just exactly the number of hearts that I needed to get through it, but that's that's uh, not related to this run. So the reason that I want the stopwatch for 9-2 is so that I can use the stopwatch on 9-2 to get through this nonsense. This is like 5-3, a bunch of turrets, plus gargoyles. And there's a bizarre um, attribute that the gargoyles have that you're probably going to see in a second here. Yeah, watch that gargoyle on the far left. You see how he zoomed up in the air like that? That's because the intensity of their up and down movements increases the longer they stay on the screen um and that 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 invisible like mod, like modifier will continue to go up even if you're using the stopwatch even if time is frozen they're still slowly building up like the the height and the, the that, they're, that they're programmed to like move to so that's why stopwatch spamming through nine two is something you have to do aggressively it's not like stopwatch then go for a little while, then oh, stopwatch again to get out of, another, of a tricky situation. No, no, no. Stopwatch spamming through nine two, you have to be really, really meticulous. You have to like, or persistent, I guess, is what I would say. You have to just like really, literally spam it. Like stopwatch, and then right before it cancels, stopwatch again. Just keep all those fuckers as frozen as you possibly can for as long as you possibly can. And the skeleton, once again, has left the building. Just another thing that Grant somehow accomplishes, even though Grant was not present for that occurrence. Um, so stopwatch spamming through nine two is not is not like unviable. It's it's it it's fine. It works, but you have to be super aggressive with it, which is why I was over farming hearts there, because I was planning to basically use the stopwatch every second that I possibly could in nine two, which could use which could lead to a lot of stopwatch usage. Um, I don't expect to. <laughs> yeah, skydiving skeleton. That uh. That again, that only seems to happen when I when I take that that right route there with Grant, and when Grant moves up, it seems to it seems to alter the the places where the enemies spawn for some reason. Um, but yeah, like I like I may have briefly mumbled earlier, I don't expect to die on nine three because um, I have Grant. Grant really eliminates any any chances you would have of encountering any problems because really it's only the first two skeleton skeletal soldiers you fight who can get you in like a tricky spot on the stairs. 
all the other ones you can fight more or less safely. And you don't even have to do this final risky jump. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of jumps you have to do across that gap there in the middle of the screen normally, but Grant can just skip that too. And um, so that's why I'm not worried about 9-3. Oh, excuse me again. Especially, especially with Grant. Uh, 9-4, I'm not really worried either. I'm not worried about this part of 9-4. 9-4, generally speaking, is the hardest stage in the entire game, unless you have Grant or Alucard to completely skip it. Um, which Grant is going to do here. Um, I crawl across the ceiling there to bait the bird over so that I can kill it, and then I'm going to have Grant um, get back up on the ceiling in a second here. Um, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, okay. Go, crawl back on the ceiling, get up, freeze time right here, accidentally pick up the dagger, which I'm mad about, and I'll talk about in a second, and then get to this part of 9-4, which is why I still half expect to die in 9-4, even though I have Grant to skip the water part, is because of the second part of 9-4, where you have to get through these skulls. I take damage, and that's just, like, I interpret that as the universe's way of saying, hey, if motherfucker, hurry up, just run across these these platforms and, and pray that the skulls don't kill you. And the skulls are, are pretty nice to me. That was a pretty merciful skull pattern. So here, I think you're actually finally going to see like a normal doppelganger kill. Um, this is what you're supposed to do, is you're supposed to throw holy water on it to stunlock him there, but he actually breaks out. He breaks out for a couple of... for for Well, I mean, he breaks out because the holy water ran out. But with a triple shot, it's kind of like the Grim Reaper stunlock, more like the Castlevania 1 Grim Reaper stunlock than the one in this game, where if you throw the holy water at a specific rhythm, where the, there are always flames present, they're like always catching him, you can make sure that he stays there. And even with a double shot, if I was a little bit more careful with my timing, I could have kept him there, but I uh, I didn't. And it didn't, it didn't end up mattering, but it could have mattered because I could have taken a lot more damage on the Skull Gauntlet, and um, and if I didn't have Grant, I definitely would have taken damage on the on the water area. So the reason why I didn't want to pick up that dagger back there and why I was pissed off about it is because I really wanted the stopwatch to get through the first room of A1. And the first room of A... Or not the first room of A1. This is the first room of A1. The second room of A1, which I'm going to get, get down to. It's right down those stairs. You'll see it in a second. And this is like a strong contender. If you have Grant... Or Alucard for nine four. This is definitely the hardest the hardest screen in the entire game, um, because you have these skulls coming at you, and instead of having the luxury to climb to like jump up and climb above them like you did in the clock tower, or to fall under them, you have to move at the game's pace while the game is throwing this shit at you. You can't like just climb over them. See, I try there and it doesn't work out, and then I just run off the edge. And I think I did that intentionally because I was pissed off and I was like tilted. That I took all that damage, and because I had it in my head at this point that um, you need at least two health to um, to get through it. You need to get through that part of A1 with at least two health if you want to get through A1 at all, because there's a turret at the very end of A1 that's hard to get over, that's, that's very, very difficult to get through without taking damage. So usually the consistent strat to deal with it is just to jump into it and take damage and get through it, which is why I really don't want to take damage here. It's not about getting out of this screen alive. It's about getting out of the screen with health to spare. That's why it's so difficult. And this is so annoying. There's a stopwatch over there that I really want to get, but I like, can't because the fucking skulls are spawning. And I've learned since this run that really the best strat for dealing with that room is to try to stay towards the top of the screen. Because this, I think it like either prevents the skulls from spawn or spawning or it sort of replicates the... Um, the clock tower situation where you can kind of get above them somehow you, you you like have some some height on them and it's harder for them to like get at you i didn't really know that at the time that i was doing this and i'd had too many like bad experiences with getting stuck at the top of those two gears there so i'd always try to like fall down as quickly as possible and that's really not smart like standing in this one spot here where I like where i can barely move is just setting myself up for failure so even though the skulls do have random patterns, and even and I and I maintain that if a skull hits you or misses you, it's not like it's not always one hundred percent your fault. There are always things that you can do to mitigate the risks, and there are um, beneficial positions you can take to to give yourself better odds. And I barely jumped over a skull back there. Um, that was actually pretty insane. I was like I was like one pixel away from it. It looked it looked for all the world like I jumped right into it, but I, I guess not. That's just how the game is sometimes. Sometimes the game is nice to you, although you never really expect it to be. Um, and then sometimes it does that. I could probably, I probably should have 
gone back to the other side of the room to got to get more hearts for the stopwatch. And that was dumb too, because Grant can actually if I have a stopwatch, Grant actually can get past that turret without taking damage. If I freeze time, then swap to Grant and then jump over the turret and then climb down the wall, you can actually get past that part without taking damage. But I, I think I just was panicking at that point and I just didn't want to like have a bunch of chain deaths on A1 and I just thought, fuck it, I'll get to A2. That's my only objective right now. If I die in A2, I don't care. I just have to get through A1. I can't keep getting fucked up by these skulls. That was my mindset. And it led me to play in a way that was a little rushed and a little bit um, suboptimal. So I'm not really glad about that. Normally I would have Trevor pick up the axe from this this candle here, but I'm having Grant do it instead because Grant is actually a better axe user for the Dracula fight. Because you, you want the axe for phases 2 and 3 of Dracula, and then you want just Trevor with the whip for phase one of Dracula. I'm sure there's, a, I think there's like a super, I think there's like a super fast phase one Dracula kill that involves using the whip or involves using axes, but I don't fucking know anything about that shit. Um, and the reason why I have the holy water, oh Jesus. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's really not much to say there. Um, that's an embarrassing situation where I have the tools available to avoid that. And then it's just a complete failure in execution. Like Grant is supposed to make the A2, um, that part of A2, you're jumping across the pendulums with the, with the bats. He's supposed to make that part like super easy because you can just jump over the bats. But there, I like mistimed my jump and fell back into the bats before they were gone, and that was that was completely avoidable, and that and that really was my fault. And at this point, I'm I'm probably like worried. Here's what I'm worried about at this point. I'm worried. Oh my god, am I gonna fail this one CC because I didn't fucking reset at the start of level one? That's what I really am worried about at this point, because keep in mind that my rules are, if my life counter hits 7, I'm done. So I actually only have 2 lives left. I can only fuck up one more time before it's it's the end of the show for me. So I really have to get this, this last part of A2 down correctly. And the fact that I have full health doesn't matter, because the danger isn't getting, getting damaged by the bats, the danger is getting knocked off by the bats. So I really have to pull this off correctly. And fortunately, this time, the bats were nice to me, they both spawned they all spawned in front of me in convenient knife range. They didn't like come at me from the back the way they did the first time. So the game gave me a break, and I was able to get through A2 unscathed. What's an interesting bit of irony about Castlevania 3, once you're, once you're as accustomed to it as I am, is that the Dracula fight is sort of like not... It's sort of anticlimactic. It's where like... You get to the Dracula fight, and then you know you're fine. The last big challenge is basically like the bats in A2, and that's like the real final boss. And once you're past that point, it's just about not completely shitting your pants on Dracula, which it's easier to completely not shit your pants than you might think. In fact, I don't shit my pants every day. And I hope that doesn't sound too... I know that doesn't sound like I'm bragging, but it's but it's a simple fact. It's just not something that I do. Anyway, the reason that I have the holy water on Trevor and the axe... like instead of just nothing, is because you actually can use the Holy Water to, to do a lot of damage to Phase 2 of Dracula at the very start. And it's an extremely minor thing. Like, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter at all, but I just but I just do it because I have a sub-weapon slot available, and I just might as fucking well. And I apparently farmed up 50 hearts while I was nattering on earlier, which is, again, extremely excessive. Um... Because it takes like 16 hearts to kill phase 3 of Dracula if you hit every single axe throw, which Grant is going to do. So factoring in human error, you would want maybe like 20, 20 to 25 for phase 3, and then maybe another like, I don't know, maybe another 10 for this fight, considering how much damage I can do, at the, I can do to it at the start with the holy water. So I basically have like 15 more hearts than I need. But hey, better to have 15 more than I need than to have... 15 fewer than I need and run out in the middle of phase three, which is something that has actually happened before. So uh, it's very much a situation where I, I was something extremely unlikely happened to me once. And now I'm paranoid that it's going to happen every other time, uh, which is why I tend to over farm hearts because I just don't want to, like I said, I don't want to fail a one CC because I didn't reset on level one. That's sort of my biggest priority right now. And I don't see any reason to risk, um, to risk failure just for the sake of not spending the time to collect more hearts. Uh, so 
Yeah, there's not really much to say about this about this part of the the fight. Unfortunately, I like Phase Three of Dracula. The 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 soundtrack kind of makes it more intense than just the footage does, because um, it's like a faster version of the Phase Two theme, um, and it is actually pretty harrowing. Just because even though it looks super boring, it's so easy for things to go wrong in this fight because it's so easy to like accidentally jump on the platforms like that and then get like carried to a spot you didn't intend to be at and then like get hit by the laser and then get knocked in the pit. So whenever I do this fight, I play it like this. I play it super slow and super boring. That's because I've been punished so many times for like the slightest bits of aggression on this boss that I that I I just don't want to fuck with it at all. So I, I apologize if the way that I do that that fight is is like boring or or not interesting. But that is that is just the smartest way to do it. And there it is. Grant Grant run Grant route one cc got through clock tower on hard mode without dying. Got went from level two to level uh, a without dying once. So I I'm pretty happy with that. Even though I, I kind of I kind of um, fucked up really badly in level a level a is where you fuck up <laughs> like like the 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 skull gauntlet in the second screen of level a that's like where you die that's where you are killed so if there's any point in a 1cc to lose lives it's there so i can't i can't be too upset with that at all uh the a2 death was kind of, was kind of dumb and the level one death was kind of dumb and completely avoidable but compared to the number of mistakes i made on my cypher route 1cc this is like world-class gameplay so I'm glad to be uploading something that's a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more bearable for me to watch than that. And Trevor and his best buddy Grant sit on a cliff, staring off into the darkness, and celebrate their victory. So I mentioned cryptically before that there's going to be another Grant-related video coming up after this. And there is, I said in my Cypha route, my Cypha only hard mode one CC that Cypha is uniquely suited to a run of the game where she, where, where you're only playing as her. And I think that that's still true, but I do think, but Grant, unlike Alucard, is actually capable of dealing damage. So I think it is theoretically possible to beat the game only using Grant. And that's what the next video is going to be about. It's going to be. It's not going to be a legitimate run. It's going to be a series of of of. It's going to be lots of different pieces of footage spliced together. So it's going to be more of like a proof of concept than anything else. But that's what's coming up next, and I'm super excited to post that because something happens in that video that is like the most mind blowing thing I've ever seen in Castlevania Three. And I'm not like I'm not not revealing it to be like to be like a clickbaity like to be like a clickbait YouTube thing where it's like check out what happens in this video. I just don't want to spoil it for you. I want you to see it happen with your own two eyes and appreciate it the way that I did. So that's what's coming up next. Uh, I should have more to say about it than I had to say about this run. And uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Thank you again for watching. Bye-bye. Farewell. 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 King's Honor, friend. King's Honor, friend. King's Honor, friend. King's Honor.